This is a derivation I think all A-level students ought to know. You know the equation, F, the frequency of the first harmonic, is equal to 1 over 2L multiplied by the square root of T over mu. But where does that equation come from? Well, let us consider a stationary wave of the first harmonic, which looks something like this, probably drawn a little bit better than that, with a node at each end. What we're going to do is we are going to consider an element of this string on this one-dimensional stationary wave right in the middle there. Now, we know a stationary wave in one dimension is formed when there is a progressive wave in one direction superpositioning with a progressive wave in the other direction. So let's look at one of those progressive waves travelling from left to right and we'll look at this element of string in that case. And we're going to simplify this picture by considering the wave to consist of a pulse that is circular travelling along that string. Now, obviously, that's not quite true, but it's a good approximation. Right at the top here, approximating circular motion is not terrible. So we've got O, the middle of our circle of string, and we've got a piece of string, which I'm just going to colour in so you can see it a bit more clearly, a piece of string there, which has a length, lowercase l, and a mass, m. Now that piece of string is experiencing tension from the string next to it, t. And I'm using red to show that tension. OK, so that's fine. Let's label some other stuff on this diagram. Let's label a dotted line going straight through the centre and this part there, which I'll call R, the radius of that circle. And this angle we're going to call theta. That's the angle between the perpendicular here, the normal, and where we're drawing the vector R, which is the radius to the edge of this, to the circular string, Fine, OK. So let's do the derivation then. We're going to look at the progressive wave where this is travelling from left to right. Well, what do we know? We know the length, L, in terms of theta and R. L is going to be equal to 2 R theta. I mean, we're measuring theta in radians, but that's OK, because we know how radians are de uh, defined as a ratio of circumference to the, um, to the radius, or circumference to the diameter, perhaps we should say. So there we go. That is our measurement of L. Now, the tension, get a different colour pen out, is acting at an angle, theta, parallel to the string. So that theta is the same as that theta there. So we can resolve this tension, if we wanted to, to look at the component that's towards the centre of the circle. And there are two of these tensions, so we're going to double it. So the component towards the centre of the circle is going to be T sine theta. So our resultant force is going to be T sine theta, but there are two of them, so it's going to be 2 T sine theta. And we can use a small angle approximation. If we consider L to be a small enough element, then theta will equal sine theta. And so this is just going to become 2t theta. That's fine. Now, this element is on a circle, and it's being accelerated downwards because that's the direction of the resultant force on it. But it's moving, well... It's not moving, it's actually moving to the left as the circle moves to the right, but that doesn't matter. The velocity is um, perpendicular to the direction of the acceleration. So we could use circular motion here, and the centripetal force is defined as mv squared over r. Well, no problem. We know the centripetal force is the resultant force on this, which is 2t theta. And we also know what theta is. Okay, we can rearrange this to get theta as the subject. 
So we could say theta is L over 2R. And plug that into this equation. That becomes 2TL over 2R. The twos cancel. And you've also got R and R there. So let's rewrite this. MV squared over R is equal to TL over R. And the R's cancel. So you are left with mv squared equals tl. Remember, l is the length of this element of string that we're considering. t is the tension in the string, m is the mass of that element of string, and v squared is the square of the speed of the progressive wave. So what we can do is we can rearrange this to get v as the subject. So v, let's start with v squared. v squared is going to equal tl over m. Ah, but we could define the mass per unit length as m over l. So for this element, its mass divided by its length is going to be the same as the mass per unit length for the whole string, because it's a uniform string. So now we can plug this into the equation. v squared is going to equal t over mu, and therefore v is going to equal the square root of t over mu. Starting to look familiar. Now, this is a wave, so we can use the wave equation. C equals F lambda. And the C in this case is V, the speed of this element, as it moves. Well, if the pulse is moving to the right, then we can consider from the reference frame of the pulse this element moving at this instant in time to the left. But it doesn't matter. The magnitude of V and C are the same. So we can say that F is equal to Rearranging this, 1 over lambda multiplied by v, which is square root of t over mu. Well, now for the lambda part. Well, on our first harmonic, there's our first harmonic redrawn, we know that the length of the string L is equal to half a wavelength. A way of saying that is that a wavelength is equal to 2L. So I can plug that into the equation and get 1 over 2L multiplied by the square root of T over mu. And that's the equation we were deriving. But what this does show is that if you've got another harmonic, let's say we've got the second harmonic, in that case, lambda is equal to L, <coughs> then this equation becomes... F equals 1 over L, T over mu. That's for the second harmonic. And actually, the general equation relating lambda to L goes like this. It says lambda is equal to 2L over N, where N is the harmonic number. So this equation could be generalized as F equals, instead of, 1 over lambda, it would be n over 2, that should be a capital L, L multiplied by the square root of t over mu. Now, I have seen in an A-level examination, students have been in the past required to know this equation because they were asked about a higher harmonic but the equation on the formula sheet was only for the first harmonic. So they had to understand that for the higher harmonics, you multiply the frequency by the harmonic number. But there we go. That's how you derive that general equation.